welcome to the Owl Hoot podcast with me, Caroline Norbury. This is a show for any person interested in the environment and sustainability. I arrived at a point in my own life where I wanted to know more about the state of our planet and how I can play my part, albeit small, in mitigating climate change, reducing pollution and supporting biodiversity. I decided that chatting to others who are already doing something might be a good place to start. So each episode will feature a different guest telling their stories in and around an environmental activity that will perhaps provide you with ideas that you can incorporate into your own life. Enjoy listening and let me know if you have a topic I'd like to hear more about on the podcast and I'll do my best to address it. I am thrilled to be chatting with Dave Golson today about the importance of bumblebees and other insects. Dave is Professor of Biology at the University of Sussex and is also the author of Sunday Times bestsellers, A Sting in the Tail, a popular science book on bumblebees and The Garden Jungle, a book highlighting the small creatures we find in our gardens and the ways in which we can help them flourish. In addition to his popular books, he's published over 300 academic articles and set up the Bumblebee Conservation Trust in 2006. His work clearly evidences the somewhat catastrophic effect we humans have had on insect populations. So without further chat from me, let's find out more more as I welcome Dave to the podcast. Thanks very much, Caroline. Pleasure to be here. So I thought we'd, uh, I always like to start at the beginning of a person's story to find out how they got to their sort of starting block in their career. And you outline in, uh, in your books, actually, your love of nature as a child. Tell me about that and how that sort of led you to a career in, uh, in bumblebees. Yeah, I don't know where it came from, honestly. I mean, I just, from an early age, loved insects and uh, nature generally. I actually, I tried to be a bird watcher when I was young, but uh, without any, uh, my parents didn't really know terribly much about birds and uh, my ability to identify anything was very limited when I was five or six. And in the end, I got a bit frustrated and I liked insects because I could, I could hold them in my hand. I could catch them and keep them in a jam jar, which you can't really do with a sparrow or whatever. I, I remember when I was about, oh, I don't know, six years old, maybe I was at primary school. And I remember finding these little yellow and black caterpillars feeding on some weeds on the edge of the school playground and um, collecting them up and putting them in my lunchbox and taking them home and feeding them. Somehow worked out what leaves to feed them or maybe my parents helped, I don't know. But uh, and eventually they turned into these beautiful red and black moths, um, cinnabar moths, uh, you might recognise from the description. Um, but I just thought that was, it's just kind of magic, you know, this turning from a caterpillar into a, a moth. And I was completely hooked and have been, you know, chasing around after insects ever, ever since. And, and I, I mean, I guess I've been really lucky that I, people pay me to do this. You know, how, how nice is that? Um, and uh, so I've made a kind of career out of my childhood hobby. I could tell you about my first experience with bumblebees, but that didn't go so well for the bees, poor <laughs> things. Maybe, maybe we'll gloss over that. So, I mean, you obviously did focus on bumblebees uh, and um, you could have picked any other particular insect. What drew you to uh, wanting to know more specifically about the bumblebee? The, actually, so I was just broadly fascinated by insects and, and I did my PhD on butterflies. Uh, I didn't really get interested in, in bumblebees specifically until I guess it was about um, uh, nearly 30 years ago now. And... Um, so I was an adult by then, and uh, um, I remember I was I was in a, there's a place called the Eachin Valley Country Park in, in the edge of Southampton, which is quite a nice, nice sort of nature reservey kind of place. And I was idly watching. There was a patch of comfrey flowers and some bumblebees. They love comfrey flying around it, and um, and I noticed something. I don't know I, if, which anyone can see on almost any patch of flowers that attracts bees. If you watch the bees, they fly from flower to flower, but they often fly really close to a flower, but don't land on it. They they get very close and at the last second, they they veer off as if there's something wrong with it. And they might do that two or three times before they actually land on a flower and climb inside and drink the nectar and collect the pollen. 
And I thought, oh, what, you know, what are they doing? What's wrong with the flowers that they're, they're skipping? And I ended up spending five years studying it. I had a PhD student, Jane Stout, uh, who focused on this. And to cut a very long story short, basically they, they fly up to a flower and they sniff it with their antennae. And um, if they can smell the sort of smelly footprint of a recent previous bee visitor, they don't bother landing because that, the flower will be empty because the previous bee will have taken all the rewards. And it just saves them spending maybe half a second climbing into a flower, which doesn't sound like much, but if you're visiting 10,000 flowers a day, then it, it, it really helps. And it just helps them to be a little bit more efficient in collecting food. I, anyway, I, I, I got hooked. I, it, it was the first time I kind of realized that they're actually rather clever little creatures. And I've since discovered many other kind of aspects of, of that. You know, they're, bumblebees are, if you like, the sort of intellectual giants of the insect world. They're, um, they, have, they do literally have bigger brains than most insects, although still only the size of a grain of rice, so not that big. But, uh, but they do remarkably clever things with that little brain. Your research has taken you to look in different places for different bee populations. Is that something you consciously wanted to do uh, in terms of uh, look broader in terms of the geography or, or was it just a happenstance, if you like? Mostly driven, it was driven by specific interests. I mean, I've always loved travel and I, I feel a bit guilty looking back at my, I dread to think what my carbon footprint might have been over the years. And I, I absolutely love going to new places and seeing different wildlife, you know, and some of the amazing wildlife that can be found in different parts of, of, of the world still. But, but in, t in search of bees, I've, I've been quite a long way over the years. So, for example, to New Zealand, which where, where I went to, to, to sort of recce the possibility of reintroducing an extinct bumblebee back to the UK. Uh, and this is really bizarre quirk of, of sort of history that um, the, we introduced bumblebees to New Zealand in 1895. And there are, there are the descendants of these bees that were taken from Kent in 1895 are still alive and well and living in New Zealand. There's four species out there. And one of them has gone extinct. The, the short-haired bumblebee is now extinct in Britain. But there are British short-haired bumblebees still alive in the world. They're just on the other side of the globe. So we thought, well, wouldn't that be really cool and try, to try and bring them back? Uh, so that was why I went to New Zealand. But uh, that was one of many places I've, I've, I've been lucky enough to go to. Um, Argentina, I, I went to uh, more recently on a, a, a investigating actually a similar kind of thing in a way, the impacts of non-native bumblebees on, on native species. Um, so just as we've taken bumblebees to New Zealand, they've also been introduced uh, the buff-tail bumblebee, a European species, has been introduced to South America and is rampaging across the whole of, well, rapidly spreading still across South America. And sadly, it's carrying at least one and perhaps more um, European bee diseases that are wiping out the native South American bumblebees. Particularly, there's a, the, the world's biggest bumblebee, which is a a really magnificent beastie. Um, Bombus dalbomii is the Latin name, or sometimes called the giant golden bumblebee, but it's a, a sort of size of a flying mouse, the, the queens, um, well, almost anyway, a small mouse perhaps, but uh, uh, but anyway, the poor things are, 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 have declined massively since the European invaders have arrived. And it's a really sad story with an obvious parallel with what happened with humans 500 years ago when the Europeans first arrived in the Americas. Um, and it's kind of sad that we haven't learned our lesson yet, but uh, there you go. Yeah, I mean, it's a curious thing, isn't there, um, between you've got species that are reducing in numbers and we're worrying about them being extinct. And then at the other end, uh, populations that are expanding, but with with sort of become becoming pests and that seems to be a sort of a common theme through the insects pop populations when did you start looking at bees from an interesting point of view in terms of answering questions about how they behave in their ecology to oh hang on a minute there's a conservation edge to it uh, there's a question yeah. around did that sort of evolve or was that always something you were aware of I, I was always sort of, you know, interested in conservation and and 
concerned about what was happening in the world uh, with species biodiversity loss and so on. But but that wasn't really, my, you know, for the first 10 years of, of doing research, I was more focused on um, sort of understanding the bees' behaviour and, and so on, the sort of, you know, the, the smelly feet and that kind of thing. And, and actually, the, the reason I sort of slowly moved on to looking at them from a conservation point of view. I mean, I think it really came from, I, I was given a book, there's a book on bumblebees that was written in 1975 by a, a guy called Alford. And, and, I, and at the time I was based in Southampton. And when I read the book, it talked about species of bumblebee that, that lived in the South of England. Um, and I, that ought to, he described just in 1975, not that long ago, really, as being common bees. He knew them well. And when I looked around for them, I just couldn't find them. You know, things like the red-shanked carder bee, the shrill carder bee, the ruderal bumblebee. There, there were quite a few of them. In fact, about half the species that he saw commonly, I couldn't find at all. And I, I started to think, well, you know, that's only, at the time it was, I guess, I don't know, late 90s. So it was only 20 or so years after he'd written his book. And I thought, well, what, where have they gone? You know, what, what mm. the heck? Happened? And I started try, to, trying to seek them out. And from Southampton, the nearest place you could go was Salisbury Plain, which still had some of these rare species. And I started studying them and trying to understand, you know, what was special? Why, why, why had some species declined and, and not others? And so, yeah, so that's how it, how it began. And from that, I got involved in trying to sort of work out how we might make farmland more bee friendly by putting in flower strips and, and I guess to cut a long story short the, the it became clear that the declines of these bees were is primarily due to habitat loss loss of all the flower rich meadows that we used to have acres and acres of I mean well actually so in in, in 1930 we had about seven million acres of lowland hay meadow and chalk downland, both of them, you know, very flower rich, diverse habitats full of bees and butterflies and so on. And by 1987, we'd lost 97% of that habitat. And that, you know, that's why bumblebees decline primarily. And what that's been replaced with is intensive farmland on the whole, arable fields sprayed with pesticides or, or monocultures of ryegrass for cows to eat, um, either of which are pretty hopeless for bees so so and and I guess in, in the last 10 years I've become drawn into the the kind of big debate over how big a role are pesticides playing in driving these declines and and there's certainly no doubt that they are contributing it's hard to say you know what proportion of declines are due to one factor or another but certainly pesticides are playing a role and I know that you've you're very much um, a scientist that's also outward looking in terms of, I mean, many, many scientists do really great work, but it's, it's, it's never really hits the public domain, doesn't necessarily hit the public domain. It stays with an academia and shared with other like-minded scientists. But you seem to have um, wanted to be outward looking and get your knowledge out there, if you like, quite early on in your, your career. What, what sort of drove that? Is, it, is that because of, because of it's a sort of conservation issue or were you just naturally wanted to share your info, you know, what you discovered? Well, perhaps a, a bit of the latter, but mostly the former. I mean, so re really it was, it was born out of frustration. Though. And yet you're right, most academics, they, you know, the, their primary goal is to get grants in and write academic papers in, you know, the technical language aimed at other scientists. And that's the kind of, you know, the, that's the core job, basically. Um, but when you're studying a practical conservation issue, you know, why are bumblebees declining and how can we stop that and, and, and support their populations better? There's, there's really little point in doing that research if you're just telling other academics that work in that same area. Because I mean, literally, you, you, you spend, you know, years doing the research and writing a paper and then it might be read by 20 people all of mm -hmm. whom are mixed they're not policy makers they're not farmers they're not conservationists they're, they're not going to actually do anything with that information apart from 
it might inspire them to do their own study, which three or four years down the line will be published and I might read it. None of it, it doesn't actually help the bees in the slightest. So I, I got frustrated and I thought, well, this is ridiculous. You know, what good am I actually doing here, doing this work if nobody's acting on it? And so, and that really led to, it was back in 2006, I thought I would try to set up this charity, the Bumblebee Conservation Trust didn't really know what I was doing at all because I had no experience with conservation charities or any kind of business or organization like that at all. So it was quite shambolic to start with, but uh, but it, it, it's done really well actually, eventually, um, after some very rocky beginnings. Thanks in part, I have to, I have to give a shout out to, to a chap called um, Mike McCarthy, who was environment editor at uh, The Independent at the time. And he, uh, he put the launch of the Bumblebee Conservation Trust on the, on the front page of The Independent in May 2006. Um, I don't know why, I mean, it must have been a, a low news day and the main editor couldn't think of anything else for the front page. I have no idea why. But anyway, we, we got about 500 members in a week. And, uh, and well, I mean, it was absolute shambles because we, we didn't have any staff to deal with them. And... Uh, you know, we didn't even have a membership database, so we just kind of opened an Excel spreadsheet and started typing in names. And but it was it was all done by volunteers, and we lost some of the checks that people sent, and we mistyped in their addresses so that they never got their packs. And and oh, it was it was embarrassing in the extreme, really, with looking back on it. But it, people kind of, I think, they realised we were new and naive and a bit hopeless, and put up with it. And it, it, but since it's it's grown and, I, and now it has I, th I think that the latest count forty two staff and twelve thousand wow. um, and projects all over the UK uh, creating habitat for bumblebees so you know it's it, that, that's been really nice and and it's all sort of you know built on the of the science that we which was where it kind of came from so evidence based conservation which which is great. But it's still not enough, sadly. You know, the, all the evidence we have, unfortunately, is is that bees are still declining. Mm. And you know, all the great work done by conservation organisations is is a bit of a drop in the ocean, unfortunately. Well, what about the books? I mean, clearly, they're written for a wider audience, and you're capturing the imagination of people that perhaps are interested in wildlife but hadn't really thought about bumblebees particularly. Um, and obviously, latterly more about wildlife in their garden have have you seen that make more impact maybe than the conservation trust because of its reach it's hard to say I, I mean one of the difficulties in in the world of conservation is is how do you, how do we engage with the people that currently aren't engaged um, and with social media and all the kind of traditional means of communication you tend to be preaching to the converted you know you're in a bubble of like-minded people and, and so you think everyone agrees with you but actually you know it's it's, it's perhaps only five percent of the population that agree with you they're just the ones that follow you on twitter and and that kind of thing and so i mean i i wrote the books in the hope of trying to get to a broader audience but it's only partly successful because obviously again you, you're always running up against the same issue that the people likely to buy a book about bumblebees or insects or whatever that I write were interested already and probably kind of, you know, already at least partly won over to the idea that we need to do more for the environment. It's the, it's the 95% that currently are just not thinking about the environment, don't realize it's important. Uh, aren't, are, and they're probably dimly aware that there's a biodiversity crisis and they, they would be aware of climate change because that's, that's climbed quite high up the kind of agenda in recent years. But, but most people are not really changing their ways. They're not doing anything to help. They're, you know, just going about their lives as they always did, um, you know, worrying about paying the mortgage and the kids' schooling and all the everyday things, which are, you know, completely legitimate things to worry about. But, but ignoring the fact that we're heading towards basically an ecological catastrophe uh, sometime this century. And, uh, you know, that their children are likely to have a harder life than they did because of that. And, and people that are just not understanding this somehow. And it, I find it very frustrating. But anyway, that's why I write the books. And, and I, I've been trying to kind of get them to a bigger audience. 
and it's why I, you know, have a YouTube channel and all these kind of, you know, any mechanism I can think of to try and kind of break out of that bubble. But it's difficult and, and it's particularly difficult getting politicians to listen. They, they seem to be in their own peculiar little world focused on getting re-elected and not really thinking long term, sadly. Yes, I completely understand where you're coming from. And it must be frustrating when you when you know what it means. <laughs> you have like, you know, this evidence staring you in from the face and thinking, why is everyone else not looking at this? <laughs> it's tough. But I think ever the optimist that the more we share and the more as you as you are doing in that you're using every media the youtube channel channel and the social media all of that stuff has got to it's got to it's got to spread even if it's not as quick as perhaps we'd like it is spreading definitely and and the, i mean there's a really interesting book uh, called the tipping point um i think it's by malcolm malcolm gladwell is it Gladwell, that's right. Very good. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it talks about how how uh, things can change really fast. You know that you, it doesn't actually take. You don't need the majority of the population to be won over. You just need enough people to believe something uh, and to spread the word. And then suddenly, you can get this kind of wholesale shift in society's behaviour as a result. And you know, I, I on a, on an optimistic day, I think maybe we are close to a tipping point where people realise, you know, that this is massive and that we all need to do things differently. We all need to consider every, our everyday decisions and think more carefully about them. So, you know, maybe we'll get there. And, and in other ways, you know, you see, if you see, I mean, there are, a lot, there are signs of all sorts of signs of change, you know, the, the rise of veganism, for example, and Extinction Rebellion, you know, young people certainly are much more bought into this than 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 older folk. Um, and if you look at, I've been really struck by how some of the more recent David Attenborough series on television have been much harder hitting than they used to be. You know, there was a time when they just showed pristine, beautiful nature and it made you feel the whole world was perfect still. And now, you know, they're panning the camera around to show the devastation and the forest being chopped down and all this awful, I mean, you know, some of them quite traumatic to watch scenes of albatross babies vomiting up plastic and walruses falling off cliffs and all sorts. I mean, I, I literally was, was crying watching one of them, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, and, and people are, people are, you know, things like gardening for wildlife is becoming really popular in, a, in, you know, which is really heartening to see. And, and it, that sort of inviting nature in to live with us in our urban areas is something I think people are, are, are coming around to and really some people buying into in a big way. So that, you know, there are all sorts of kind of promising signs. And, and I think, it, you know, the future really hangs in the balance now. You know, we, we either change quickly and, you know, uh, avert the worst of climate change and, and, and biodiversity collapse um, and things won't be too bad. Or we carry on for another 20 years like we are at the present and then it'll be too late and, mm. and the world will be in dire trouble and I honestly don't know you know which is the most likely outcome it could go either way catch me on a good day and I think we might do it but uh, I, you know I really don't know I think uh, you raise a really uh, a good point there in your in your own personal life and in the and, and the wider world in that to me it does feel like it, oh this is going to be the decade isn't it um, that we've got to make change and I think it's balancing that you, you rightly say it's now or never. You're pushing that this is this is serious, folks. There's no getting away from it. It's here and now important. But you're also enabling people to take some sort of control within their own within their own world. I mean, with your for example, with your latest book, The Garden Jungle, you give loads of tips about what people can actually do in their own little space, however small a space they have outside, they can do something. And I think giving people the chance to be able to take some control rather than it feel like it's this huge, great big thing that somebody else has to sort out. At least you can marry that, that scary, oh my God, with, well, I'll just do my bit. And then I, at least I'm doing my bit. And starting in the garden is a, is a great place to start. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I mean, as you say, 
a lot of these conservation issues, are, it's all too easy for people to feel there's nothing significant they can do. You're just helpless. You know, you see footage on the news last summer of the Amazon burning and, uh, you know, I, it's so frustrating and, and just makes you sad. But with, with wildlife gardening, even if you've got a tiny garden, you can make a difference, you know, you really, and you can see it happen in, 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 in just hours almost. If you bring in the right kind of plants, the right kind of flowers, your bees will sniff them out, butterflies will arrive, all sorts of insects will turn up. So people can actually, you know, get hands-on involved in conservation right outside their front door or back door. Even if you've only got a terrace or a roof, top or a balcony or a window box you know you can do something and it's a start you know it's empowering and 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 I do think there's genuinely think there's potential you know we can't solve all of the we can't solve the biodiversity crisis by wildlife gardening but not in its entirety but we can we can chip away at it we can help you know there's there's 22 million gardens in the UK alone covering it's it's about half a million hectares of of land which is a bigger area than all of our nature reserves and gardens can be surprisingly biodiverse the there was this lovely book by a lady called jenny owen um i don't know if you've come across it but she um she spent she lived in leicester she has a li little garden it's about an eighth of an acre so you know the average kind of small urban garden and she spent 35 years cataloging every plant and animal that she could find. I mean, obsessive in the extreme, but her grand total was just over 2,700 species in this little garden. Um, and and 2,000 of them were insects, different types of insect. So, you know, but, I mean, that's extraordinary, isn't it? To think that yes. that much can, can live in, a, in an urban garden. So, so you know, certainly we could, we, we, not everything can live in gardens, but a lot of life could could thrive. So if we could get most of those 22 million gardens pesticide free, full of bee friendly flowers with a little pond in the corner and, you know, all the other things I, I write about in the book, then then and, and if we could get the councils to create, you know, wildflower meadows in the parks, to not mow the road verges and the roundabouts, to sow them with wildflowers, to, you know, manage all the other urban green spaces, the cemeteries and so on, in wildlife friendly ways, then you've got a ready made kind of national network of, of, of insect friendly habitat. And, you know, and that's a kind of no, sometimes called a no regret solution. Uh, it, there's not really a downside other than some people will have to get used to things not looking quite as neat and tidy as they used to perhaps, which I think is, is a good thing anyway. But obviously there are some people who are, you know, like their pavements weed free and their road verges trip cut every two weeks and that kind of thing but so so the you know there's a real opportunity there any sorry i'm gonna to have to get in a plug for my new books <laughs> the garden jungle which came out 2019 now i've got a new one out on the first of april this year uh, gardening for bumblebees which is a more of a practical guide with lots of pictures and everything to all the best plants to grow and things you can do practical projects in your garden to make it pollinator friendly and, and generally wildlife friendly but then I do have a rather doom and gloom book coming out in August, Silent Earth, which is sort of, in a, perhaps it's pretentious to say it's the sequel to Silent Spring, but it's, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's about this crisis and, you know, all the evidence that, that we are in trouble, that insects in particular are in rapid decline. But then, you know, what can we do about it? And, and uh, the, the, the final third of the book is how we can fix this, which we can, but, um, but we need to get a hurry on. Well, it sounds like both of those books will be useful to many people. I think um, providing something that's really e easily accessible and people can get on and do stuff is great. And it's also great to have, this is where we're at. This is how it looks. And it reminded me, as you said that, that when in your YouTube videos, you're in your garden and it's noisy, it's noisy in your garden because you've got insects. And it's it's also about 
changing people's attitude and expectation. It's a bit like the veg thing, isn't it? We go to, if you go to a supermarket, your expectation of what a particular veg looks like, uh, it's got to be this particular shape, this particular length. And it's, this, it's kind of the same in terms of our, you know, our gardens and our wider environments that, oh, we expect everything to be cut short. And one of the things that really stood out to me when I was uh, doing some research with you is thinking about things in different ways, thinking, oh, actually, that's not a weed. That's just a flower. <laughs> Why did I think of that as a weed when it's pretty and yellow? <laughs> it's just, it's changing what we think is, how we think things should look in a very sort of orderly fashion. It's, it's odd, isn't it? The whole, you know, concept of a weed. I mean, it's just something we invented really for, and, and if you ask them, what is a weed? They sometimes kind of can't immediately answer. I mean, they could name species they think are weeds, but why they decided they're weeds, they find hard to justify usually. Um, because, you know, as you said, I mean, weeds are basically wildflowers and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit um, of a silly thing to say, but you can just get rid of all the weeds in your garden, but just by renaming them flowers. Um, and, and, and many of them, I don't know, have been slightly demonized, you know, and I mean, a ragwort is a classic example. I, I, I grow it in my flower beds and it pops up occasionally around the garden and I just leave it and the bees and butterflies absolutely love it. And goldfinches come and eat the seeds later in the year and it, it doesn't take over. It's poisonous. If, if I were to dry it and feed it to a horse, then that would poison the horse. But if I would, there were a great many garden plants that you wouldn't dry and feed to a horse, you know, okay. or eat your... Um, it doesn't mean they're bad plants. It just means that they've got some natural toxins in their leaves to stop the herbivores from eating them. You know, we shouldn't demonize them for that. So, yeah, and, and things like mowing the lawn, you know, the, the, I and mean, part of it, I think, is that there's this kind of, we need to change people's sort of expectations. And there's, a, I think some people are, would be embarrassed to let their lawn grow long because they think the neighbors will kind of peer over the fence and, you know, look disprovingly at them. Uh, and that, that, in some cases, would definitely be true. So we some, somehow need to kind of persuade the majority of people that actually the right way to manage a lawn is to mow it as infrequently as possible. You know, it's, it reduces petrol, carbon emissions, and it's fantastic for wildlife just to let the grass grow longer. It also helps to capture carbon. Uh, so we need it can work in the other direction. Though. We should well, what we need to aim for is a world where the person who keeps mowing their lawn all the time with stripes up and down it is the one being frowned upon by the neighbours peering over, saying, "Why on earth are you mowing your lawn again?" And so they're embarrassed that that them and, and they stop. Uh, and you know, maybe, maybe that's the kind of that's where we need to get to. That you know, well, now we've reached the tipping point when people are, are embarrassed into stopping mowing rather than embarrassed into mowing. I should imagine for many people, actually stopping mowing would be a nice thing. There'll be less of that whole, are you going to mow the lawn? Have you mowed the lawn this week? And all of that dialogue that might go into a, you know, a number of families' households about when and yeah. who's going to mow the lawn. <laughs> so that could be an easy win. It's funny, isn't it? Because the, the, the stripy mown lawn is a relatively new concept you know there they, we, I, I exactly when the first lawns were created but of course we didn't have lawn mowers until relatively recently um, in the days of push mowers it would have been incredibly hard to maintain a, a lawn and before that not that long before that but you people cut their lawns with scythes if they and only very rich people would have any kind of lawn then but but you know with the advent of kind of um, petrol mowers we've got used to the mown lawns with stripes up and down them you know like a kind of miniature Wimbledon tennis court in the back garden and we just need to kind of challenge that view of that that's what a lawn should should look like because actually you know a shaggier lawn with buttercups and daisies and dandelions and speed wells and clovers and all the other things that tend to pop up if you just stop mowing and bees and butterflies flapping about is just so much more interesting and, and exciting and fun than than that boring sterile mown lawn but you know persuading people that that that's the <laughs> that's the, the way forward. yeah and just getting them to kind of relax and you know instead of getting the mower right get a deck chair and make themselves a gin and tonic and, and <laughs> watch the keys um, 
but we're getting there. We're definitely getting there. It's really interesting, I think, in lockdown that uh, there were loads of people on social media just posting pictures of, of, of um, roadside verges full of flowers, uncut roadside verges, and saying how amazing they looked and how they'd never seen so many flowers and so many bees and butterflies, all because the council couldn't get out and mow. And, and that's led to a kind of a, a fairly sizable shift, I think, in, in what's normal and, you know, a realisation amongst many councils that actually they didn't need to be mowing anywhere near so often in the first place. And, in, in, you know, the expectation from the public that, that these verges should flower again this year. So, you know, I think that's a really interesting example where I, I think things have changed. I really hope things have changed. I hope, you know, mowing isn't back to normal this spring. Uh, so, you know, we, 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 we're getting there bit by bit. For sure. Uh, you, obviously, you've got two books coming out this year. What's what's next? I mean, I don't know how, you, to be honest, I don't know how you fit in uh, uh, book writing amongst everything else you're doing. But uh, <laughs> uh, have you got plans for the, what's going to happen beyond this year? No, I actually have. I, I, when I finished Silent Earth, I breathed a big sigh of relief. And I, I've been slightly taking it easy the last couple of months, just 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 sort of chilling, you know, with the gin and tonic. And well waiting. done. No. Um, no, I mean, actually really busy with online teaching at the moment and trying yes. to keep our poor undergrads happy. You've mostly been in some kind of lockdown for the last year and uh, um, not getting great value for money from their uh, student fees. So um, that's quite a challenge. And uh, I do feel sorry for young folk, particularly at the moment, you know. Um, yes, I do too. Live in the countryside with a big garden and uh, my age, but if you're a a 19 year old or whatever it must be really frustrating I imagine yeah really hard so what would be your um if you wanted to leave one thing that people could do or rec you'd recommend something what, what what would it be oh there are just so many it's so hard to come up with one thing isn't it yeah um, <laughs> so what I would I'd, I'd like to rattle off about 10 things but I mean if, if you've got a garden don't use any pesticides that's probably the simplest thing to say Plant a few bee-friendly flowers. Don't mow your lawn too often. Start a compost heap. All really simple things that you know any anyone can do if they've got a garden, and you'll you'll see you know the results in no time at all. That the garden will come to life and start to to buzz, and you'll have the beautiful sight of butterflies flapping around, and and you'll see more bird life attracted by the insect life, and uh, generally you'll be inviting nature to come into your garden and, and that's basically what I'd love to see everybody doing. It sounds it, it sounds like a good visual and that leads me nicely really to the the final question because clearly I could ask I, there was I wrote so many questions that I could ask you which obviously I have not covered but <laughs> maybe another time but to end on okay think about 2050 what would you hope what would you hope that you could see in the UK and in, in, uh, what the land looks like, or maybe beyond the UK? How, how does our world look in 2050 to you? Yeah, well, I'd love it if we ended up, you know, with our urban areas greened with flowering trees and fruit trees in all the parks and wildflower meadows and long lawns not being mown and pesticide-free towns, completely pesticide-free, uh, teeming with life. But then the, the countryside, we need to change as well. We can't one of the things we haven't really had time to talk about is, is how we need to change farming. We need to find a way to grow food that, that works with nature rather than, than destroys everything, um, which is a, sadly, you, you know, what it does at, at the moment. We need to type, need to grow food in ways that builds carbon in the soils and looks after soil biodiversity, that, that supports healthy pollinator populations to pollinate the crops, that encourages natural enemies to naturally control the pest populations in the crops. Um, and there are farming systems out there that, that, that do that and show great promise. But unfortunately, we're not really using them very much at the moment. So I'd love it. I mean, for example, I, it would be great if, if our cities were surrounded by kind of horticulture operations providing fresh fruit, seasonal fruit and veg for the residents of the cities. So local grown, virtually packaging free, pesticide free food that could be sold via veggie boxes or farmers markets. We need people to re-engage with the significance of their shopping decisions in terms of their impact and, 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 and buy local seasonal produce wherever they can, reduce their meat consumption. 
this is a whole whole huge can of worms you've opened for this final question. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> but basically, we we need to bring the countryside back to life, and and we not just need we absolutely have to because if we carry on down the current intensive farming model, it's not sustainable. It's destroying pollinators, it's destroying the soil, and it's adding to, hugely to climate change. Got to find a different way to grow food, and we we can do it. There's plenty of models out there, but we need to. We need to be prepared to really change the way we grow food. We can't just kind of tweak the existing industrial farming model and think it's going to be okay. It's not. Yeah, I think that's um, a really good point, well made. And uh, there's definitely a sequel I feel coming. Perhaps once once you once your uh, your your second book out this year, but maybe you'll come back and talk about that, and we'll address the other issues we've not uh, been able to cover today. Happy to. Thanks, Dave. It's been marvelous been fun. It has been an absolute pleasure to have Dave Golson on the podcast talking about bumblebees, insects and conservation. I put links to Dave and the Bumblebee Conservation Trust on my podcast page at www.theowlhoot.com forward slash podcast. I'd like to thank Andy Shaw for audio editing, Jeremy Jones for providing the music and you for listening. If you want to hear more stories of people doing great things that positively impact our environment, then please do subscribe, rate and review through your podcast app. And why not share this episode with someone you think might enjoy it? In the next episode, I'm chatting with Greg Hewitt on his involvement in environmental community projects, including his current role as community lead at Plastic Free Chesterfield. Until next time, bye for now. <laughs>